So if you've been taking a math or science class for any longer than about a week now, you've probably realized that there are some calculations that you do over and over again, and the only thing that changes is the numbers that you put into an otherwise slightly complicated formula. Um, the example I've got up here is the Pythagorean theorem. So you've got a triangle of side lengths three and four, and you want to find the length of the hypotenuse. So you take square root three squared plus four squared. You can do the same thing with basically any pair of numbers, five and 12, one and one, etc. And we learned earlier how you can use vPython as a calculator. So I can use these commands to obtain the answers for these. So the first two are some famous Pythagorean triples. You might remember from studying for the SAT, three, four, five triangle, five, 12, 13 triangle. And then this one is just square root of one plus one gives you the square root of two. Um, but if you're working with a lot of right triangles, like say you're doing vectors in an intro physics class, it can get kind of tiring to have to write this out every time. And let's say you, you watch the video on variables and you were clever and learned that you can do this where you uh, put in variable names. You could have uh, square root A squared plus B squared. You can run that and it will plug in the values two and one and give you the same result as if you had plugged two and one into one of these lines. But even that is still a little clunky, right? It's taking you three lines to put in what's basically a simple calculation. Then you have to go back and change these things. You have to remember what they are. You have to remember where you wrote these lines. Sometimes you have to copy and paste it if you're trying to do multiple Pythagorean theorems at once. It's in an instance like this that you might want to write a function. So functions are, uh, they, we, we know what a function is in mathematics, right? Is you, you put in a set of numbers and you get out a set of numbers. Uh, that's a very coarse definition of a function, but it works basically the same way in a computer program. You can define a function using this def command. Um, DEF is short for define. And then you give your function a name. Now it needs to be a name that doesn't already exist. <clears throat> So you can't use print, you can't use square root, you can't use pi, but we, we're we working with the Pythagorean theorem here, so let's define this one as pt. And what you do is you, you use an open parentheses, and then you indicate how many arguments you need to give the function. So when you're working with the Pythagorean theorem, you have two arguments, you have side a and you have side b. So let's go ahead and call those, uh, let's, let's see, should we call them a and b? Let's call them side one and side two. Here's the thing about these variable names. It doesn't matter what you call them. I could even call them A and B, and it won't know them as the same names, A and B, but I don't really want to get into a lesson on local versus global variables. Uh, that's, that's for another time. Um, but what you do is you say, I want to define a new function, give it the name PT, and it's going to have two arguments. And for this next chunk of code, I'm going to call those side one and side two. And to tell it you want to set up a chunk of code, you need to use a colon, just like we use for the loop command. Um, and when you hit enter, it's going to automatically indent you. And as long as you're indented, you're inside of this function. And so what we can do is we can uh, create the hypotenuse to be square root of side one squared plus side two squared. There we go. So I've got the same formula that I have over here. I'm not printing it yet because what I want this function to do is just return this value because I don't necessarily always want to print it. I might want to do something else with that value. And so what I can do here is to, uh, is, is, is to say I want it to return this value. So I use the command return hype. And so that's going to say, whenever somebody calls this function, I want you to return this value whenever the function gets called. So if I just run this code right now, it's not going to do anything differently, right? It's going to produce one, two, three, four numbers because I haven't actually told it to use this function yet. This is just a function definition waiting to be used. So instead of having all of this stuff up here, I could have print Pythagorean theorem of three comma four. And it should give me the same answer five that I got before. Let's double check that. Yes, it does. I get five up here, I get five down here. And I can do the same thing with all the other uh, instances that I've created. So I can have print, uh, oops, Pythagorean theorem of five comma 12. I can have print Pythagorean theorem of one comma one. I could even have print Pythagorean theorem of the a comma b that I defined earlier. And I'll get the same results. So I'm gonna get the same results twice now. 
There we go. And it's a little bit cleaner. I've only had to write this messy thing once. And I just call this the Pythagorean theorem. So I've defined my own function of two variables to say, I'm gonna input two variables and you output this one variable, which is pretty neat. And you can make these functions as complicated as you want. You can have them uh, return to you a list of variables. You can have them return uh, text strings. You can have them uh, print things from inside the function. So if, it, if the function encounters an error, you can have it print an error. Um, but what I want to show you is my favorite function to define, and that's the factorial. So you know that the factorial is uh, is what you, happens when you um, multiply an integer times all the integers that came before, or the uh, counting number, excuse me, I guess it's only defined for counting numbers. So four factorial would be four times three times two times one. Um, Glowscript doesn't know what an exclamation mark means. I don't think it has a built-in factorial function. At least I haven't found one yet. Um, but it's actually pretty simple to define. We're going to define a function called fact for factorial, and it's going to have an integer uh, input. Now, uh, we'll need later on we'll need to check whether it's actually an integer, but for right now we're going to assume that the user is uh, is honest enough to put in uh, just an integer, not a um, not a not a rational number, uh, or not a number with decimal places, I should say, um, not a floating point number. That's what I meant. Um, so we're going to put in actually not even a rational number, a counting number. We're going to put in a counting number here, and so what you do is you need to have it multiply by all the other numbers that came before it. Now I could set that up as a loop, but it's actually more fun to set this up as a function that calls itself. Let me show you what I mean by that. We're gonna use an if statement here. So we're gonna say if n is equal to one, if n is equal to one, we know what the answer is. One factorial is one. So we would say if n is equal to one, return one, period, stop. There's nothing else to worry about. But what if it's not? What if n is not equal to one? Then we, so we've got, uh, if n is equal to one, uh, you do this. Otherwise, meaning, or else, you're gonna do something else. Well, if it's not, you need to multiply it by the next number and then the next number and the next number. So basically you need to multiply it by the next factorial. So then we need to return n times the factorial of n minus one. And you look at this and your brain starts to hurt because it's a function calling itself, but that's totally legal. Functions can call other functions, including their own selves. So when this thing calls n minus one, it's going to loop back in here, check for whether it's one. If not, it's going to go to the next n minus one or n minus two, and it'll keep going until it returns one. So I've got both cases covered. Uh, I've got it returning for both of them. So let's test this thing. Uh, let's have it print for me, please. Let's do a simple case, factorial of one. That should give me a one at the end. So we'll ignore all the other Pythagorean theorem stuff. Lo and behold, I get factorial of one. And actually, let's... Uh, Let's label it so we rem so we know we're looking at the correct line. Uh, factorial equals one, cool. Uh, let's do two factorial. So if we do two factorial, it's gonna come in with an n of two. It's gonna skip this part, gonna go to the else. It's gonna return two times factorial of one, which means it's gonna come in here, find n equals one, and it'll return one, and then I'll have two times one. So it should give me a two. Factorial equals two, okay, that worked. All right, how about three factorial? Three times two is six, six times one is one, or six times one is six, excuse me. Uh, six times one is the same thing. Uh, I've got a six there. All right, let's try something even crazier. Let's do a 20 factorial. Hold on to your seats. Okay, that is a big number. I don't know uh, what 20 factorial is, so why don't we ask Google what 20 factorial is? Uh, Google is telling me the 20 factorial is 2.4 times 10 to the 18. 2.4 times 10 to the 18. Our factorial machine is working and it's doing it much rather quickly, uh, much rather quickly, rather more quickly, that's what I mean, uh, much more quickly than, uh, than I could with a calculator typing out 20 times 19 times 18 times 17 times blah, blah, blah. I can just use the factorial argument here. So that is pretty cool. So you can use a function to call other functions, including itself. Now for a bonus round, uh, if you feel you've learned enough, uh, feel free to uh, uh, check out at this point. We need to check whether this thing is actually an integer because if I pass to this thing a, uh, say like 20.1 or something, it's gonna continue going in an infinite loop. 
and that's not going to be good. I don't even want to demonstrate it because I don't want my computer to crash. So what we can do is we can check whether n is, a, is an integer. Uh, so what we need to do is we need to check for whether n is an integer. Um, let's see, so the, the best way I know to do this is to use this built-in thing called the modulus function. So the modulus is, is a, a fancy term for remainder. If you remember in third grade when you first learned division and you hadn't quite gotten to decimal places yet, uh, so, you learned, uh, so you learned remainders. So if I divide n by one, uh, this, this percentage sign means make a division and then give me the remainder, meaning give me the, the stuff left over. Uh, so if n modulus one doesn't equal zero, so this double equals means I'm asking you whether it's equal, exclamation mark equals means I'm asking you whether it's not equal. So if n modulus one isn't equal to zero, then the thing must not be an integer. And I'll leave that as a comment, not an integer. Actually, uh, Actually, also, also, I need this to be greater than zero, don't I? So I want to have if n effect if n modulus one is not equal to zero and n is less than. Uh, actually, let's make this an or. Excuse me. Or if n is less than one, not a counting number. There we go. Because I could put in negative five, and this would it would pass the modulus test but it would keep going down to negative infinity. It's not going to reach that. So it's not a counting number. So we say print error uh, fact received non-counting number. Um, technically we do have zero factorial defined as one, but I always find that to be kind of a trivial case, so I don't really work with it that much. And we'll just hit return. And it's gonna return nothing. So that'll be interesting to see what happens with that. All right, so let's run factorial 20, make sure we get the same number. Okay, we got the same number, so this is still working for that. Now let's just add in a point zero zero one. So say I made a little bit of an addition error on this 20 and got 20.001. So I get two things that happen. One is error, fact received non-counting number. So that's this error statement right here. And down here where it says factorial equals, it's returning nothing. It's returning an undefined quantity. So vPython is telling me that that's undefined. So there you have it, a factorial function that even checks for you whether this thing is a counting number. And you know what, just to be a purist, um, let's do if n equals one or n equals zero. And let's have this be n less than zero. There we go, just to, just to be able to get zero factorial. So if I do factorial of zero, <clears throat> I'll get factorial equal to one. Okay, there, now I've satisfied the mathematicians who tell me that zero factorial is equal to one. All right, uh, thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time. Bye-bye.